Your morning is good so far. Unfortunately and fortunately, um, we are having service via Facebook. The reason I said unfortunately is because we were all anticipating going to the house today and fellowshipping with each other. And uh, fortunately is that we still have an opportunity to preach the gospel and to fellowship. I have the family here today and we see that even on Facebook Live, one is late. So anyway, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Settle down, settle down. All right. Um, we have a quick announcement that we're going to make um, before we actually get started. And I know that um, this is uh, going to be a little bit unorthodox. And uh, but nevertheless, we're going to get things squared away here while I set up my page here. All right, everybody should be on. Everybody should be able to hear. Everything is good. All right. The quick announcement that I do have um, is that. Let's see. All right. Is that. Um, the youth department is doing an event during service for the Super Bowl. So on Super Bowl Sunday, the youth will be doing um, an event. They call it Super Sunday. Um, Amani, I don't know what this says. Oh, asking everyone to dress in their favorite team gear and come and have a Super Sunday with the Lord. That's the second Sunday in February. That's the 11th, the 11th. What time? At 10 o'clock, regular 10 o'clock service. They're gonna do their Super Bowl Sunday. So make sure you wear those tired jerseys, unless they are Chicago Bears jerseys, then it's pretty fresh. But anyway, um, no Cowboys or Panthers jerseys allowed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, come on and fellowship with us. How you doing, Sister Walker? Good to see you. Sister White, good to see you here. Um, and those that are on my page, uh, thank you so very much. I should be streaming on all pages. Once again, we are the Cedar Grove Baptist Church located at 2624 Saluda Road in Chester, South Carolina, where I am the overseer there. And uh, we have a host of ministers, trustees, and deacons at your beck and call. If you were to come and fellowship with us, we guarantee that you will have a good time. How you doing, Sister Sophia? Good to see you in the house. Today we are coming from the book of Third John. Third John, some of our older saints call it Three John. Third John, and it's only one chapter. So we're gonna say Third John chapter one, verses nine through 11. We can also say 3 John 9 through 11, since there's only one chapter. So why don't you go ahead and find that? And I'm going to give you a whole minute to get that together. And then we will be right uh, uh, starting verse number nine. And we will be right back. Just give us about 60 seconds. Find that scripture, John, third John, verses nine through 11. It's only one chapter. So find that for me and be with you right back.
All right, we are back. Welcome again for those of you that are just logging on. We are the Cedar Grove Baptist Church located at 2624 Sugula Road in Chester, South Carolina. I find it necessary to explain why we are on Facebook Live instead of at the worship service at Cedar Grove. It's because we had an issue with the power. Um, the power suppliers had an issue and they cut power to, I don't know how many people, but nevertheless, we were unaware that the power would be on shortly thereafter. But uh, since we had already made the calls and things of that nature, we decided to go ahead and, and do the Facebook Live. So that's why we're here today. Nothing is wrong with Cedar Grove. Everything is all good, um, but there was a power situation and without power, we couldn't really have a wonderful service like we normally do. So that's why we're here. So again, we thank you so much for fellowshipping with us. I see you, Sister Bratton, Sister Moore, Brother White. What's going on, QT, Deacon Brown, Deacon Pickett. I see all of you. Thank you so much. And also have Amani in the background. I have Sus Harris in the background, Sus Harris. All right, and we have Tristan on his way back in here. So um, everybody was geared up and ready for worship service this morning. So we're gonna do the best that we can this morning. Once again, we're coming from the book of 3 John, um, verse number 9 through 11, verses 9 through 11. And our subject today is uh, simply protecting the house, protecting the house. So <clears throat> let's pray one with another that we can definitely do what it is that we do with the help of the Holy Spirit. And I wish I could have the praise team here to uh, sing us a few songs, awesome. but you know, <laughs> um, and, and our hymn choir to sing for us and, and all that, but um, that's gonna escape us today. So let us pray. Gracious God, we come this beautiful sunny Sunday morning, thanking you for the rain that we had yesterday. Just thank you for all the growth that that rain will bring. We thank you, Father God, that even in the rain in our lives, Lord, that we know sometimes we might feel overwhelmed by it, but once the sun begins to shine, there is new growth. So we thank you for that. We thank you for helping us, healing us, and setting us free. Thank you for being our God, Lord God. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins, all those things that we've done that's not uh, in alignment with your will and your way, those ones that we remember and the ones that we have forgotten. We pray, oh God, you will forgive us, create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us, Lord. We also pray that you would draw us nearer unto thee and comfort us in those ways where we fall short. We pray, Lord God, that you will preach the word to me as I preach to your people. Teach us, O oh God, as to your word. All of us will learn. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Here we go. In 3 John, we have somewhat of a small problem. Well, it's not a small problem. It's a problem in the church. It seems like a lot of these scriptures lately are talking about problems in the church. Um, and, and primarily it's, it's always uh, or usually started by one person or one group of people. But nevertheless, we know that God is still in control and there is absolutely nothing that he cannot fix or solve. So we're excited about that. And just like in every other situation, God sends someone to the rescue per se to uh, give us direction, lead us and guide us along the way. Because we do know that um, there are, are, are problems in various churches and uh, people are struggling to try to figure out how to get through those things. But in the meantime, when you have some people who really don't understand the power of God and have that faith that's needed to defeat these battles, then the church crumbles and the church people, they suffer. So this is one of the things that was going on um, you know, in this, in this span of scripture. And uh, Paul found it necessary to write um, to this church um, and to let them know that God is still on their side and that he recognizes, um, you know, all the people who, who, who are steadfast and who, who, who have stick to itness. He was recognizing them for their strength and for remaining um, in the race when there are so many distractions all around them. So. You'll notice a few a few names here that that's not normally used, um, but they're very important. And this message to uh, Gaius, who is possibly a disciple of John, 
And when I say that, I don't mean that he worshiped John. I mean that John was probably the one who led him to Christ. So you'll see disciples of Paul, disciples of John, you know, and then you'll see Christians, which are disciples of Christ, but they're all under the umbrella of Jesus Christ. And no one took personal credit to say that these are my followers or anything like that. Uh, but nevertheless, Gaius is one who was probably um, converted under the preaching of of uh, John. So here he even called him. He says, he said, this is the elder. He's talking about himself. John is talking about himself. And this is a uh, uh, verse one. I just want to lay the roadmap of what's going on. He says, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius. <clears throat> now Gaius, <clears throat> again, is a follower of Christ. And there are several men in the Bible that's named Gaius. So it was a popular name. And you don't see this man in any other places, you know, except in this incident or this instance um, where it's very important that we know who he is and how he actually um, falls in line with the word of God. And he says he called him beloved. So he he loved this man. He loved this man. He cared for him and and he preached the word to him. So we're not we're not we're not sure if this is the same one that was mentioned in the 19th chapter of Acts because the name was so popular. Um, so that's why I say that this is the, the time that he was um, actually mentioned. <clears throat> he says, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. In other words, who I love with the love of God. And I like how he put that, because um, when you love someone with the love of God, there are a lot of things that you um, will allow to take place without getting angry. And uh, you'll be in that posture of praying for them when you love someone with the love of God because you recognize that they are they they have fallacies they do things wrong they fall short just like we do and we won't be so quick to judge them so in saying that he says beloved okay this is basically the second time he said that in just two verses and remember I said always be mindful when you see words repeated um, because there is a significance to that word being repeated he said beloved I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as my soul prosperous. In other words, he's saying everything you do, I, I pray that God is with you and that you prosper on this journey that you're going through. I pray that you prosper, even though he was having some rough situations going on in his church or in the church. He says, I still wish you God speed. I know that God is with you and on this journey. And I just pray that you will continue to follow him. That's the paraphrase of that. <clears throat> and then he says, for I rejoice. Notice in verse three, he says, for I rejoice, rejoice, how greatly, he says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. So <clears throat> it is, it, it pays to have a good reputation. It pays to have good character. It pays to have good personality because all those things precede you where you go. Uh, what you don't want is someone to recognize your name or associate your name with someone who is always uh, boisterous, someone who's always fussing, fighting, cantankerous, you know, someone who's never, never pleased, always complaining. And we know those people. We all know those people who, who something is wrong all the time. I mean, it, all the time something is wrong. And it gets frustrating for the simple fact that um, in today's society, you're looking for good things. You're looking for things to lift you up, things to encourage you, things to make you smile. You can get the negative stuff anywhere, everywhere, any time of the day. But it seems like our spirits, our souls just get worn down with negativity and people complaining. There's so many things to be grateful for. Why don't we pick some of those things to, to uh, concentrate on instead of all the negativity uh, that we can bring to other people? So his 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 uh, his personality was was of such that people from all around would talk about it. He even got all the way to Paul uh, to John about um, you know how good this man is and how he is steadfast in the Lord. And that's good to have, you know, when someone can recognize you as one who fears Christ and one who loves the Lord and stuff like that. Because I, we we talk about people all the time, and um, you know. The, 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 the fastest moving news is negative news. And we already know that you do something good, people probably will never ever hear about it. But you mess around and mess up, then you it's all it's all over everywhere. Everywhere you go, people pretty much already know. 
So knowing that, he says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. Again, his personality, his character is a testimony of who he is. And our personalities, our character is a testimony of who we are. So if we're always getting in trouble, people are going to call us a troublemaker. If we're always lying, people are going to call us a liar, right? If we're always creeping in other folks' homes, folks are going to call us a cheater. It's all those things that, I mean, we, we label ourselves and, and, and things that we do, our walk and our talk, we label ourselves. So it's good that there is one, at least one, there, there are more, but there are at least one in the church who um, was, was upright and doing what, what pleased God. And it got all the way back to John. He, has, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Now, he, it may be because this man was younger. It could be simply because he was a convert, a convert of John. We don't exactly know why he called him his children, or maybe it's just he, he sees himself as one of um, more maturity than Gaius, uh, spiritual maturity. It's, it's unknown. It's really not that important, but nevertheless, just to show the uh, solidarity and the, uh, the familial um, uh, love that they had for one another and respect. So now look at verse number nine, where we're coming for the message. And, um, and let's concentrate on, on what it means to protect the house. Um, when you are basically in your own home, the last thing you want to happen is, <laughs> let the first lady sing. <laughs> The last thing you want to happen is to, <laughs> oh my gosh, the last thing you want to happen is for someone to come in and take your stuff or to cause harm to your family. So what do we do? We go out and we purchase firearms and we get knives and we uh, buy dogs and alarms, cameras all over the house so that if there's anything that's coming against the home, we are prepared to take care of it. We are prepared to make sure that it does no harm to our stuff or to our people. We make we make sure of that. And be honest with you, uh, most of us are willing to give our lives to protect um, our families and, and our homes. So this is, this is the type of um, attitude that John is trying to uh, relay to the people uh, in the church. He's trying to say that sometimes you have to give everything to protect the house. We have to protect the house because there are valuable things in the house that can become corrupt and be stolen if you do not protect the house. Now, all these things are, are what I'm saying, are just metaphors for uh, God's people in the church or in the church house or in the house of God. And I'm not just talking about the um, uh, earthly church, but I'm also talking about the spiritual church as well. So he says here, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, let's talk about this dude, Diotrephes. <laughs> Diotrephes was one of those cats in the church who always had something to say, thought he ran everything and everybody. Some churches have those type of people who just want to run everything, want to be in the midst of everything. And if they don't like it, it does not go. It does not pass. This is the type of fellow that Diotrephes was. Diotrephes had a big mouth, but he was very, very persuasive. That's dangerous when you are not truly walking with the Lord and you are extremely per persuasive. Now, we have a lot of folks like that. And remember, I told you all once before that sometimes they are the go-to people. Because when I when I manage people, I, I try to find the loudest one, the one with the biggest mouth, the one with the worst attitude, that but but also has the greatest influence. That's the one I am going to connect to. That's the one I am going to uh, uh, get side by side with and try to teach and try to mentor and things of that nature. Because that's going to be my sounding piece. That's going to be that's that's going that's, that person is going to be the one that's going to help me run the shift and run the unit, that, that's gonna be the person because everybody's already listening to them. So if I have them on my side, that makes my job a whole lot easier. So here, old brother Diotrephes was that type of fellow. 
Sometimes they can work to your benefit, but most of the times they work to your detriment. Now he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among you, received us not. So in other words, that word preeminence also means pride. He's a very proud person. And he wants to be looked at and have the attention of everybody. He wants everyone to look up to him. When they wrote to come to the church, Diotrephes intercepted the letter, right? Intercepted the letter and did not let them come. He didn't want them to come. Understand that anytime Satan is in control or Satan is, is at the head or the forefront, he's not going to want anyone that is spiritual in the midst. I want y'all to get that real good in your spirit because Satan's number one objective is to keep God out, keep God out and also to influence those with his thoughts. So here Diotrephes, right? Who thought he was uh, this spiritual fellow and this great guy is allowing Satan to use him to do things that are detrimental to the house or to the church. And Diotrephes was very successful in influencing people to do wrong and to go against church polity and to go against church policy and to go against the teachings of John. So John let them know, hey, Gaius, I sent you all a letter and, and saying, hey, we would like to come. We would like to fellowship. We would like to check on you guys. But Diotrephes said, no, you all are not welcome here. All right. So he says, this man loveth himself, loveth the preeminence, the power of being on top of everybody else. Verse 10 says, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds. Now, this was nothing that was evil. This was nothing that was vindictive. Uh, he wasn't going to try to get back <laughs> at Diotrephes. He prayed for Diotrephes because Diotrephes' mind and his heart was in the wrong place. But John also recognized that he had to face God. He had to uh, be accountable to God. God has an expectation for him, and he had to make sure, regardless of what other folks said, he had to do what was right. And that is one of the biggest problems in our churches today. We follow people. We want to be like everybody else, and we want everybody to like us. So sometimes we compromise on our position in the kingdom. We compromise so that people will like us and so there's no conflict. Who likes conflict? Only certain people like conflict. I don't like conflict, but one thing is for sure, I'm not gonna let just anything happen in God's church. And I think that most of us are that way. But we have to get to a certain point where we see that someone is blatantly coming against the kingdom and before we will say anything. But here, John is saying, listen, I, I tried once and he told us we couldn't come. So I'm letting you know whom I beloved that we will be there. And when I get there, I'm going to have a conversation uh, with Diotrephes and I'm going to let the church know about Diotrephes. But in the meantime, I'm going to give you direction until we get there. He says, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. And you have folks like that now when they see that there is infiltration, godly infiltration coming to try to set things right. They'll start spreading bad words, bad language, and they'll start using words against you to try to paint you in an unfavorable light so that people will not like you. There are some folks right now who don't talk to one another, don't even talk to one another because of what somebody else said about them. You didn't investigate for yourself. You just got the words from someone who didn't like somebody else. You believed it. You carried it. You trusted it. Sit up, son. You trusted it. And guess what else? You began to let it harbor in your heart. So when you saw this person, what did you do? You began to take on that same ideology about the person that the person who brought that mess to you gave you. Are y'all walking with me? There are friendships who have been broken, marriages that have been broken relationships that have been just completely dissolved because somebody else said something. And believe it or not, some of those friendships and some of those relationships that would have been a blessing to you and worked in your favor, you did not pursue them because of what somebody else said about them. I'm not saying don't be cautious. I'm not saying don't take the words of someone else. But when you have a malicious person bringing those words, people out for their own gain, and you know who they are. You already know who they are then you have to take what they say with a grain of salt. 
But here we see here that Diotrephes not only wouldn't allow them to come, but he began to spread bad favor with other people to try to keep uh, John out and try to keep uh, John's disciples out of the church because he already knew that if John and his boys came, then he would not be the preeminent one. He would not be the, the one above everybody else because they knew about John. They heard about John. They knew that John was a true apostle. They knew that John was one who actually walked with Christ. So there was that clout that John did not accept, but was given to him, one who actually walked with Christ. Can you imagine if you have this big head fella in the church saying all these things, right? And then you have a fellow who actually was there when Jesus Christ uh, raised people from the dead and he healed them. He sat with Christ. He broke bread with Christ. He walked with Christ. He ministered with Jesus Christ, right? As he uh, healed a woman with an issue of blood, raised his his daughter, told the man at the gate to get up. All he had was weak ankle bones. Told the man at the beautiful pool, Jay, hey, you don't have to wait for the troubling of the water. If you want to get up, get up, take your bed and follow me. Come on, really? Who's going to have more influence? The one who walked with Christ or the one who's making all kinds of nonsensical uh, comments about those who follow Christ? So he did not want John there because John would take the spotlight from him. Not that John wanted it, but he would because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. So many of us today have that relationship with Jesus Christ and folks don't want us around because of that relationship with Christ. And when Satan sees us coming, he begins to tremble because those of us who are truly walking in the light, you carry that light with you and you also carry a power with you that Satan knows that he cannot defeat. Why? Because God encamps an angel or angels around us every single day and that anointing is seen by Satan himself. He knows who's walking in, in Christ. He knows that. And those are the ones that he wants to influence to turn away from Christ. All these different things of the world, all these different things of our friends, all these things that we see in here, whether it be at work, whether it be at the gym, whether it be at school, he wants to influence you and turn your mind away from Christ because he understands the power that you have if you recognize the Christ within you. I want y'all to understand that. All of us have that light when we accept Jesus Christ, but the light in many of us are dim because we don't utilize our fellowship and relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why you don't feel the way you used to feel when you accepted him. You don't get what you used to get when you read your Bible. Some of us don't read it anymore. It's off to the side somewhere. We only pick it up on Sundays. It's because that light is becoming dim. We complain more about church than we fellowship in church. We complain more about church people than we pray for church people. It's a bad situation that we get in and that rut and that crux that we get in. And it's hard to get out. Why is it hard to get out? Because now that the light is dim, Satan identifies that you are walking in a weak uh, state and he tries to grab you and pull you further away from Jesus Christ. That's what old Diotrephes is trying to do. He is trying to set things up so that he can be the preeminent one, not realizing that he's walking in darkness. Many of us are walking in darkness and we don't realize that. But God wants us to make sure that we walk in the light so that when our home is attacked, when there are things coming in the house that shouldn't be there, we can identify it and we can work with the Holy Spirit to get it out. I want y'all to walk with me on that now. So he says here once again, wherefore, if I come, I am going to deal with Diotrephes, the deeds which he doeth against us. Right. He says uh, he's pratting against us. Now, the, the word pratting in the Greek text means to gossip. And pratting also means one who is coming against forcefully. So even though John and his, his disciples, uh, when I say disciples, those who were, were converts under his preaching. Now, when, when, when they come, when, when they come on the scene, they're not going to be there to play. They're going to be there for business and to recoup or recapture the joy in the church. Many churches have lost that joy. Many churches have lost that joy. Why? Because they have allowed the enemy in the house. They have allowed one to come in to steal and to pilfage the joy that they once had. And now there's nothing but confusion. I was talking to somebody a little while back who was talking about the confusion in, the, in their church and how they, uh, 
I don't know how they basically cannot stand it there anymore. No, your objective is not to leave. Your objective is to get strong, to gird your loins and to hold that shield and to grab that sword and to fight. You have to get the enemy out of your house. What would you do if somebody just walked in your front door at your door at your home? You're just going to let them come in and do what they want to do? No, I don't believe there's a person that will allow that to happen. What if they came and start to um, to influence your family, your children, your wife, your son, your daughter, whatever, and they start to influence them with things you know are not right? What would you do? Would you allow it to happen? No, you wouldn't allow it to happen. You'll do everything under your power to get them out of the house. That is what we are supposed to do when evil comes into our church house, when when wrong teachings come into our church house, when people try to bring the world into our church house. We have to understand that we have to stay there and fight. Why would we leave and allow it to be destroyed? That's against us. Are y'all walking with me? And all these different things that's on the television now, all these things that God is bringing to light, all these preachers that God is starting to expose and all these different types of things. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. Some of it is not true. A lot of it is true. And God is allowing us to see. Now, we're blinded. If we're putting on blinders, we'll never see other folks wrong in the church. But if you would just take those blinders off, you will see what God is trying to show you and show us. Are y'all walking with me? So now, now we have a problem. Diatrophes has a problem that John is coming anyway. He says he has as pratic against us with malicious words and hot content. I'm sorry, or hot content therewith. So when he's talking about John and those who are coming with him, he's talking with fervor, with zeal. And he is sounding like he's telling the truth all the while he is lying. And when they call him out on his line, he doubles down on his lies to try to make sure that when they get there, that he will still be the preeminent one. He says, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would. Not only did he not want uh, John to bring church folks, but the church folks that were there, he didn't want them in the church if they were saved. I might as well say it, if they were saved and filled with God's Holy Ghost, he did not want them there because they were coming against him. They recognized that he was wrong. And they were like, no, 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 no. We are going to protect our house. We're going to protect the house by all means necessary. So he began to rail against them and kick them out of the church and wouldn't allow them to come to church simply because they recognized that he was a nut job and they wanted him out of the church, right? So notice he says, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that they would and cast them out of the church. That's a sad thing when you cannot handle the truth and you cannot be in the midst of folks who are living in the truth. The number one thing you have to do is to try to get rid of them and get them out of the church. There's a whole lot of folks afraid of your testimony. There's a lot of folks afraid of your preaching, a lot of folks afraid of your teaching because they know that your preaching and your teaching does not fit well with their walk of darkness, and they are going to do all they can to try to destroy your ministry, to try to destroy your forward momentum in the church. We have churches who are growing by leaps and bounds after the pandemic, some who are dying and falling by the wayside. The ones who are growing are the people who are willing to fight and have that stick to itness and have the determination and able to go and do what thus said the Lord and forget about all the distractions. Those are the churches that are growing. The churches that are not growing are the ones who are sitting back complaining, are fighting one another, railing against one another, fighting against the uh, the uh, overseer of the church and all these different types of things. You know who they are. You've seen them. You see them today. It seems like they had one member before. They have two members now. God is not playing. He knows that time is winding up. Of course he knows that. And he knows that the church is first and foremost the, the 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 litmus test to his people. So we have to make sure that we do all we can to protect the house. I don't care who you are, what color you are, how old you are, what your body shape is, how much hair you have on your head. You are required and expected to fight for the house. So in doing that, 
not just keeping uh, evil out, not just keeping bad um, uh, liturgy out, but it's bringing good energy in. So when you come, you should be ready to magnify the Lord, not look around to complain, not worry about anybody else, but you are to bring to the service a joy and an exuberant praise because we are there to worship and praise God, not to look around at the pew, seeing who's there, not to judge other folks, but your accountability is being seen by Jesus Christ. So with that being said, these folks, wouldn't allow, or Diotrephes and his boys would not allow regular common churchgoers and worshipers to come to the church because they did not align with Diotrephes' theology. Not Christ, Diotrephes, right? So now verse 11, and I'm almost done, y'all. It says, beloved, there it is again. He loves Gaius. He loves him, and he holds him to high degree. So when God has put you in a specific place, he has found favor with you, and he expects you to do what you are supposed to do in the church, regardless of what other folks say. Because when you have a vibrant and a working and growing ministry, there will be people who will join that ministry just to see you fail. And many of us give up. We get tired of it. We throw in the towel. We just can't take it anymore. And all these different things. God is not putting you in a place for you to... Um, uh, give up on it. And I know sometimes we sometimes we 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 want to move to a different ministry. That's fine. But leave it when you leave it, leave it in a good place. Leave it in a good spot. We understand that. God understands that because sometimes he moves you from one ministry so that you can be fluent in another ministry. Are y'all walking with me? So with that being said, it says, beloved, follow not that which is evil, because there were some that Diotrephes was able to coerce to follow him, those who were zealous in the spirit, zealous in the church, right? Who were one of the ones who were willing to protect the house. But uh, Diotrephes just, he, he was he was just way too cunning. He was way too cunning and, and, and uh, uh, influential. You know, I mean, even today, we know that some things we shouldn't be dealing with because number one, we shouldn't have some of those things. And we do it anyway because we have influencers who talk about things that are so great. You are broke, don't have a dime in the bank, and still cannot find a way to pay today's mortgage. But an influence, influencer can get on and talk about a purse, a tool, or whatever. And guess what? We're trying to find every way to try to get it because they say it's so great. So influence are very powerful in the way that they can make us do things that we would not normally do. So here in the church, it was the same way. He says, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. Are y'all walking with me? He that doeth good is of God. And that means everywhere from the family all the way to church, all the way to your job or what have you. So if you don't give, did you not know that if you don't give your employers a full day's wage, you are stealing from him? Did you know that? If you don't be obedient to your parents, then you are being disobedient to God. Did you know that? Are y'all walking with me? Oh, I heard somebody cough in the background. Now, notice this. <laughs> it says, beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. I wish y'all would say that with me. It says, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So God is not pleased with you if you do evil. So who was he talking about? He was talking about the atrophies and those who follow him. And if we fail to follow Christ, if we fail to walk in the newness of life, then guess what? We are not of God either. Are y'all walking with me? I hope you're walking with me. Y'all, well, this is going to do it. I want y'all to make sure that you read the entirety of Third John. It's only one chapter and only 14 verses. Uh, yeah, 14 verses. So read that, and uh, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hear about a fellow named Demetrius. Uh, also, he he he's a good report. So there were some good people in the church trying to protect the house, but we need everybody to protect the house from the pulpit all the way to the door. We have to work on one accord to make sure that God's favor is shown in that place. So until we meet again, we pray God speed for all of you and that you all will be thoroughly blessed. 
And as we say it down here in the South, y'all be blessed. Everybody say, hey, hey, hey. come on, y'all. Amen. Everybody say, hey, hey, hey. amen. Everybody say, hey, hey. amen. I can hear you. Amen. Amen. Now, may the Holy Spirit in this week can be with you. Rest with the Bible with you now forevermore. Let everybody say amen, amen, amen. Jesus Christ died for your sins and he was brought back to life from the grave that we might have a right to the tree of life. God bless you. God keep you. Y'all be safe and stay dry. Bye-bye now.